Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again, Mishmash Monday. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a great weekend. I know I had a fantastic weekend. And I'm saying that, being that this is Thursday, I haven't had the weekend yet, but I'm um, I'm assuming I'm going to have a good weekend. And you know what happens when you assume. A couple things to talk about. I told you today was going to be a special episode, and it is because today is uh, November 6th, and 19 years ago today, we lost a uh, national treasure, national for the UK. You know, I love the UK, but we lost Fred Dibna. Fred was a steeplejack and uh, kind of a, a hero in, in many eyes. And, and I just found out about him a couple years ago, a few years ago, from one of you subscribers from the UK said, hey, you should check this guy out, you know. And I'm so glad you told me about him because the guy is a, is unbelievable. And he was just a fantastic craftsman. <clears throat> and what he was, was he was a steeplejack. Now, for those of you who never heard the term before, steeplejack was somebody that would maintain, uh, fix, and demolish, you know, chimneys and smokestacks during the Industrial Revolution. There were smokestacks all over the place because we were burning mostly coal and coal soot and smoke. Uh, you had to get it up high into the atmosphere so that the wind would take it away or else your cities would be filled with this thick, heavy smoke, hard to breathe. So they had to be a minimum of, uh, you know, 100 or 200 feet high to get them up into where the wind would take the smoke away from the city. He would uh, maintain these and using a ladder. It was just amazing. Now, if you've never heard or seen uh, anything about Fred Dibner, there are scores of videos on YouTube. But all you have to do is put Fred Dibner in the uh, in the search box, and you'll come up with dozens and dozens of great videos about this man's life. And what happened? What made him so popular is back in the 1980s, a film crew uh, just thought it was interesting that these guys were still around that would do it the old-fashioned way of taking down these uh, tremendous smokestacks. Uh, using the old-fashioned method of they would uh, bore a hole out, you know, using a uh, uh, an air hammer. They would uh, knock a big hole out of the bottom of the, the smokestack. And then they would place these uh, piles with wedges to support the smokestack as they, you know, chipped away the brick. And then they would make a fire which would burn the piles. And then eventually the smokestack would, would, would fall. Now, uh, obviously, years ago, they went to Dynamite, which does it, but uh, this was the old-fashioned way, and people were just amazed by it. A lot of people are still amazed by this man. And then afterwards, uh, once they got to do a documentary on Fred, he became so popular, then they went into his other parts of his life, which was he rebuilt steam engines and just an interesting guy. I promise you, you will not be disappointed if you watch any of the documentaries on Fred. He was just a fantastic guy. So today was a special day for that. Um, <clears throat> also, I have a good friend of mine, I'm uh, attending his birthday party tomorrow, and uh, he's turning 60, my buddy Jerry, I was in Scouts with Jerry. Many of my lifelong friends I met in Scouts, it was the, uh, the best decision I ever had made in my life was to enter that organization, and um, so Jerry's going to turn 60 tomorrow. And uh, I, I bought something for Jerry that uh, I think you'll find interesting. I know he will. Jerry's like me, you know, you give him, you put money in an envelope, it means nothing. You give him something that he likes and he'll remember it. So let me show you what I picked up for Jerry. Let me talk a little bit about the subject and let's get into the attic. You, everybody loves an attic trip, let's go. Okay, for those of you new to the channel, here we are. We're in the attic where all the cool stuff is, right? I mean, cool stuff. I can't even tell you. We, we said we're going to go through a lot of these things, but uh, some old projects, some old things, some cool stuff, old things we did here on the channel, some interesting things, steam, some blow molds, <laughs> my old cowboy days, and st again, more steam engines, a lot of lanterns up here. Uh... RC plane that I found. Look at this, more lanterns. But check this out. This is where we are. This is how high we are. You can see over there. And you can see part of the Whitestone Bridge right there. And the rest of it, the Bronx is over there on the other side of the trees and down there, it's Manhattan. But there's the flag you see every day. Now I decided that I wanted to give Jerry a uh, bayonet 
okay? Uh, I thought that he would enjoy this. Jerry is, he likes knives. And he, what kind of maniac doesn't like a knife? <laughs> bayonet especially. Bayonet is a term used for a uh, type of knife that gets attached to the end of a rifle. Uh, it first came uh, invented in the 1600s in a, a place called Bayonne, France. And that's where the word bayonet comes from. But there's all different types. They've been used in extensively in World War I, World War II, the Revolution, as you know. Uh, I don't want to go into a whole history of it, but they're amazing. And uh, I'm not a collector. <laughs> I'm not a collector of bayonets, but how can you not like them as a kid growing up? I'm an old man now. He's 60 years old, so... When you go buy in a, a, you buy one a year, you know, it adds up or one every couple of years anyway. So this is just some. And when I bought these, bayonets were army surplus and they were inexpensive, okay? You could go into any uh, army navy store for 10 or $15. You could pick up a beautiful representation, a piece of history. I don't know what happened. Today, bayonets have gone through the roof, so they're not cheap anymore. But let me just show you a couple of these that I, you might find uh, interesting. This here is a Swiss bayonet. And of course you could tell it's Swiss because everything that comes out of Switzerland is absolutely beautiful. And first of all, look at the frog. This is a frog with the bayonet uh, slips into here, which holds it. Just an absolute piece of workmanship, right? And of course the blade, stainless, you know, Swiss. Look at the, the manufacturing mark here. Can you see that? Oh, look at that. Now, bayonets traditionally weren't razor sharp, okay? Guys that were in the service would sharpen them to make, but they were not meant, they were kind of meant that you can handle, you know, you wouldn't cut yourself on them. They weren't meant to, like, do any knife slicing. They were meant for piercing. And uh, there's a serial number. Anyway, the Swiss bayonets, and these were pretty cheap, so I bought a couple of them. Uh, then you got other types here. The Russian type, they use, like, a phenolic handle, and uh, what's interesting about the Russian type bayonets is, you see here, now if you notice, it's ground on one side. And the reason that is because you get a sharper angle for your cut. Okay, so this one was meant as a utility. This was meant not only as a bayonet that would clip on the end of your Kalishnikov, but would also has a saw on it. And, uh, and this little gadget here, you see that little hole here? Well, you would put that in here like this. There's a little uh, nib on your your scabbard here. You put it on, and this would cut barbed wire. See, you put the barbed wire there, and it would cut barbed wire. And it works great. What a great design, uh, right? Interesting design. It's got that uh, spring, it won't come off. Another one, another type of a Russian bayonet here, again with the Bakelite handle, right? And now Russians aren't known for making the most beautiful work, but the, back in the day they made some good stuff, and this was one of the things. Uh, again, this is a rubber, a silicone type rubber handle that, if you are cutting a uh, a wire, okay, you see how tight that's in there. Again, if you were cutting a wire, you had some insulation. If you were cutting a wire that was uh, had power running through it, so very interesting. Again, uh, Russian. Here we have some an older one. You can see here, you know, the older ones like from the Garands and things like that. This one here is probably World War II. Uh, you know, it's covered with cosmoline. That's not rust. It's it's like a, a, a grease, you know, cosmoline. These did rust up quite a bit uh, because, and especially like this one here. You see this one here? A little bit of rust on there. Or some of you guys would call that patina. <laughs> That's rust. And that's because of the leather sheath. Remember we were telling you about this, or leather frog rather. The leather frog resting against the steel, it holds the moisture and that's where you get the rust from. So leather is not good next, but this one here, you can see is an older one. This one here needs some cleaning up. Again, it's greased. It's got that original cosmoline on there. A lot of these I bought and just stuck upstairs. They come in a bag. A lot of times when you buy these, they'll come in a plastic bag when you buy it. This is what they look like from the factory. So if you go into a army surplus store, you'll see these. They'll be in a plastic bag like this, stacked up, or they'll come wrapped in paper like this here. They'll come wrapped in paper like this one here. Another one. This I just unwrapped. God knows. This is the way you would get out of storage, and you got to clean it up, you see? Take a look at the 
blade here. Uh, okay, let me see. Okay, this one here, you see it's got a clip here. It's clipped on there so that it won't fall out there in shipping, but there's no rust in there. This is the way they would come. So you got to clean them up when you usually get them uh, any kind you get surplus. There we go. And another uh, interesting one here. Here's another interesting one. A little bit of surface rust on here. Got to take care of it. You can see the beautiful workmanship though, right? On that uh, frog and uh, here. But look at this here. You ever seen one of these before? Vietnam era. This is a folding made by Camelus. Folding, uh, I'm sorry, machete. See how that clips open? And there was your guard. You would pull this guard off here so that you wouldn't cut yourself. Now, there you go, a folding machete. And you, you laugh because you say, well, what? Not much of a, you know, when you fold it down, when you, you do close this, you got to be careful when you're closing, you want to cut yourself. But you got that much blade sticking out there, but it was meant with that it would just take up less room in your pack. And this was a guard that would go on there so you wouldn't it wouldn't cut through your pack or something. Folding machete. These things too have gone up in price and uh, very interesting, right? But so what I decided to give Jerry this beautiful bayonet. This is a M5A1 bayonet here. Isn't that beautiful? This would go on a Garand. This was Korean War vintage. This is an M8 scabbard. And this scabbard is pretty rare because it's the faux wood grain scabbard, which was fiberglass, but meant to look like wood grain. Just a beautiful piece, isn't it? I got this on eBay. It took me a while to find a nice one. I wanted to get him one that was in a nice condition, that worked well. His father was, uh, was Korea era in the service, and, and I thought he would enjoy this here. You could see here the difference between a, a standard uh, knife that you might carry as far as a, uh, a service knife and a bayonet. This is here is a Mark I, U.S. Navy. You see there's no, uh, there's nothing that could clip onto the rifle back here. Whereas here, this is meant to clip on a rifle. So this would be like a service a knife and this would be a, uh, a bayonet. But isn't this beautiful? I think he's really going to enjoy this. And uh, But what I wanted to do is uh, I always I just wanted to put it in a, in a box. I wanted to make a little box for it because uh, everything is always nicer when it comes in a box, right? So what do you say we go downstairs? I'll just give this a little bit of a cleaning wipe down because it is all original. And we'll make a little box for it back to the basement. Okay, we're back down the basement. The problem is I got all this junk on my table, so let's clean it all. And off. we're set up for woodwork, okay? We have this uh, piece of scrap wood here. That I'm going to use. We won't use this knot, obviously, but we have some nice clear pine down there. What we're going to do is we're going to make a couple slots. Again, a quick box. So let's get cut. One of the best purchases you'll ever make as a woodworker is a electric miter saw or a miter bar. And this thing is just, they make them. They're cheap now, but I bought this about uh, probably 30 years ago or something. We're just going to cut off that knot because we're not going to use any of that. Now we're going to put two grooves in the bottom of this piece of wood okay and the reason we haven't cut it into sections is because it's much easier to run this longer piece through the blade and then cut up the section so we're going to need two grooves we already determined it's going to be inside of the box because it's uh got a little discoloration so we're going to have one groove about a quarter of an inch off of the top and another one will be flush with the bottom for the base that'll make sense in a minute Okay, we made two grooves in the wood, one up here, and we made one down here close to the bottom, so that piece just is almost like a, a rabbit. So now we'll take the length of the knife here. We'll, now we'll cut off the length and we'll have two equal pieces. Now here's a great tip if ever you need to cut two pieces of wood identical length. Here is the length that we want the size of the box. That is the size of the bayonet okay more or less it's the size of the bayonet so that's what we want the box to be now i want another piece the same exact size so what we do is we take the piece of wood here like this we're going to cut this end off here and what we're going to do is we're going to place one on top of the other like this okay get the two back pieces exact they got to be exact on the back that there's no 
no uh, difference here. Now you're gonna put it over here. And what you're going to do is once you have it slid up, that it's exactly the same in the back. Remember, it's gotta be identical in the back. What you're going to do is you're gonna hold it tight. You're gonna bring the blade down a little bit like this. Sorry, my hands it away. You're gonna bring it down like this and you're gonna slide it up to the blade, just touching it lightly. Then you're gonna remove this top piece of wood and cut it and that'll be exactly the same as the top because that'll take into effect the kerf of the now, blade. Now, if you do it that way, when you take the two pieces of wood and you put it on a flat surface like this, let me get the top. When you put it on a flat surface like this and hold them together, there should be no difference in the wood on the top here. You should not feel any ridge whatsoever. It should be perfectly aligned. That's, that's a good way to do it so that you never have to worry about having two pieces of wood that are one is longer than the okay, other. Okay, now we're gonna stand up. We're gonna put the bayonet in there and we're gonna make two end pieces. So we're just gonna lay it in there, make sure we have enough clearance. We're gonna draw a line on the outside of here and cut those two off and make two of those pieces. Now it's important to glue it first, glue everything up and then drive your nails in or pins so, and I'm using long grads uh, so that, because when you're going into end grain, you don't get a lot of grip. So this will be very strong. I'm we're nailing it now that the glue is dry. Now, see, here's that rabbit we cut around around the bottom. We're gonna cut a piece of this. This is nice on one side, a little messed up down here, but we're gonna cut this and we're just gonna trace it out and cut a piece for the bottom. Here we go, we cut the piece. You can see, fits right in the bottom there. You see, and we flip it around. You have a nice bottom to your box. And then you can either nail it or you can glue it, whatever you want. Now, you remember I found that plexiglass in the garbage a while back. I took a piece of that, nice plexiglass. I'll clean it up, but I cut it here and then I smooth the edges down. Okay, you smooth the edges using a razor, a single edge razor blade like this. And you just shave it off until it's nice and smooth along the touch, along the edge rather. And then, that two, those two grooves, remember those two grooves that we cut early? Now this will fit right in. There's your, your top. We have the bottom over here. Bottom goes in like this. And there's our box. Now you say, well, what about over here? Well, when we cut that piece off, we saved it. That's this piece here. And this piece goes on top here. And it'll look, let me get the right side. When you close it, we'll screw it in from the bottom and it'll look like a regular box until you slide that to the right. We'll cut that off. What do you think? Hey, here we go. Again, we got to put the bottom in, but I'm going to put a coat of stain on it. Although I got to see Jerry in about 12 hours, so <laughs> it's going to be a tight one. Anyway, you see how this works now? We did it like this. See? And on the bottom here, countersunk four screws, so that'll hold it. Plus, we also glued it. And, uh, and there we go. You know, uh, let's see what it looks like. We'll put a little stain on here and we'll be good to go. I'm calling this project done. You can see what we did here. Now, I'm, I just got to put a coat of shellac on here, but this will slide out here. The bayonet can go in, fits nicely in here and closes right up. And uh, he could display this whichever way he wants. He could, you know, it's, it's, you never make the box better than the gift. I learned that a long time ago. One time I made a box that was so ornate that everybody was passing around the box and the gift kind of got left behind. But there we go. A little gun stock on here. I'm going to put a coat of shellac and that'll be drying in uh, about a couple hours and we're good to go. So what do you think of that? Okay, so in closing, uh, the party was last night. It was a great time. His wife, Elfie, did a wonderful job, and uh, she kept it a secret. He was kind of surprised. But I was thinking that I forgot to put some kind of instructions on how to open that box when I gave him the gift. I wrapped it up, and I said, later on, I was thinking about it this morning. I was thinking, I hope he, uh, he realizes that box opens up instead of trying to pry it open. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great day. We'll see you again on Wednesday. Take care now. Bye-bye.